Hello folks, this is the uh, week two. Getting started with JavaScript, although we took a very brief look at it last week. Um, the materials for this week cover um, Murak, the Murak book by Ruval Kalba and Murak, and the uh, Ducket book. Um, primarily, we during lecture, we focus on the Murak material, but the uh, Ruval Kalba uh, Murak material and the Ducket material are in some ways distinct. Ducket actually does some really interesting, kind of more artsy way of looking at things and sometimes, you know, includes details that may not be in Murak and vice versa. But we'll focus mostly on the Murak book. So this week we're covering getting started with JavaScript. So, um, chapter two, getting started with JavaScript. We will look at a variety of stuff, including uh, if you're given a specification for JavaScript application that requires only the skills presented in this chapter, code, test, and debug the application. So you should be able to do some coding, testing, and also removing bugs based on uh, problems. So when you test a JavaScript application with Firefox, um, display any, mer any messages in the Firefox error console. We may or may not uh, really take a look at that, but that's um, Firefox is actually one of the better uh, browsers, probably the best browser for actually doing, uh, looking for errors, because the error console is actually very useful. Um, for knowledge, I won't read through all of these, but we're going to learn a whole lot about comments and prompts, alerts, uh, syntax for methods and properties of an object. So a very brief look at objects right now. We haven't uh, created our own custom objects yet, but we'll take a look at the window object, which is the uh, global object inside of JavaScript. We'll also learn about arithmetic expressions and the order of operations and precedence, um, how to do variable declarations and how to do assignment statements, um, parse int and parse float and escape sequences, um, and also the is nan, which is a, is not a number function. Um, describe the flow of control, so we're going to learn um, if statements, while statements, and for statements. So these are all different types of control structures. So if statement being a selection control structure, and while and for are both repetition control structures. We'll learn about. So here are two attributes of the script element that are useful. Script element in the head section that loads an external JavaScript file looks like this. So if you're in a, an HTML file, inside the head section you might have this. So you might put script and then src as an attribute, equals, and then calculate underscore mpg.js. This is the name of a file. We're assuming at this point you're in the same folder as, a, as the HTML file itself. If it were in a folder after or below, you would have to put the name of the folder first, then a forward slash. Um, if it were in a folder above, um, let's say you're in a folder B, and then B is inside of A, and let's say the JavaScript file is inside of A, and you're in B, well, how would you go up one level? Where? Well, you would put, um, very simply, you would put dot dot slash calculate mpg dot js. Dot dot instructs um, the JavaScript engine to look a, or well, in this case, the HTML um, browser engine to look one uh, level above. So that's what dot dot means. If it's two levels above, it's dot dot slash dot dot slash. Three levels, dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash, etc. It's without having to know the names or start at the very very top of the whole shebang. So um, a script element that embeds a JavaScript in the header section. So there's uh, two major ways. You've got the um, um, external JavaScript file, which is very common. And you've also got the embedded JavaScript in the head, head section of an HTML file. So again, this is a segment. Obviously, this isn't the full HTML file. But you have the head section. You have whatever else is in here, meta tags, titles, etc. Then you have the script uh, tags. So you've got one tag here and then the closing tag there. And then inside there, this is no longer HTML. This is JavaScript. All right, so we took a look at that before. So make sure you're familiar with the terms external JavaScript file and also embedded JavaScript file. Um, JavaScript in the body of an HTML document is the third way. So you've got the JavaScript in the header, embedded in the header, now you've got it embedded in the body. Uh, the external 
being the third type. Um, this is the third one we're actually looking at. So for example, you might have script, you have var today equals new date. That's as a, uh, an available um, type of object that we can have called today. And then you could do today dot to date string. All right, so later on there's another embedded script here, uh, get full year. So you've got the date string and then you've got a copyright statement down here which just gets the year, 2012. Uh, no script element um, can be useful. Um, the no script element is coded um, after a script element is uh, shown in the second example on page 53 um, in the book, in the current uh, book. So if JavaScript is disabled, the content of no script will be uh, displayed. But if it's enabled, the script element is replaced by the output of the JavaScript code in the no and the no script element is ignored. So no script's good if you have a browser that's um, you know it's turned off, right? So the no script right here is such that if the script doesn't work here, that means the browser won't execute whatever this stuff is. And then um, if it is enabled, it will execute this stuff, but it won't show anything that says no script. So because JavaScript is enabled, so it's kind of a, uh, a toggle. It'll do one or the other in this case. Here's a block of uh, JavaScript code. You're creating a function named join list. It doesn't take any parameters. Um, var join list equals function. The keywords here. Open parenthesis, close parenthesis, no parameter. You've got a curly brace here and a curly brace there delimiting the beginning and the end of the block of code. Okay, block of code belonging to the function join list. Then you've got the email addresses here and their values. We saw this last week. And then some uh, little blocks of code with the if clause, else clause, etc. We'll do a little bit more with that this week. There are some rules um, for syntax in Java. The syntax is, again, just the basically the, um, the rules that you have to follow in order uh, for it to be JavaScript. You can't just willy-nilly make up whatever you want. It won't know. Um, the JavaScript engine won't know what you're trying to do. So you have to follow the rules. The uh, basic syntax rules for JavaScript are JavaScript is case sensitive. For example, if I write the word if, like we have in the if statement up here, that is a keyword in JavaScript. It is distinct from lowercase i capital F. That could be a variable name. It could it would be a bad variable name because it's a little bit too close to this, but um, it is case sensitive. Um, Email address with the lowercase e, if you did one with an uppercase e or an uppercase m or an uppercase a, those would all be different uh, variables. So you have to use the exact same case, okay? So uh, lower, 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 upper, lower, 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 etc. And then a one at the end, they have to be identical. Um, the other thing is JavaScript ignores extra white space within statements. So as you're writing your JavaScript, um, we, we use white space, um, which is the extra spacing like here, like indenting it right here and you know putting this on another line. We could put all of this garbage on the same line, uh, but it wouldn't uh, be good because it'd be very hard to read. Okay, I call it garbage because if you put it all on the same line, then it's garbage. This isn't so much garbage. This is pretty decent. Um, but the JavaScript engine doesn't really care how you do it, but other developers and you yourself will the next time you go back to the code to try to see what you intended. Each JavaScript statement should end with a semicolon. <clears throat> so as you notice, semi statements such as alerts have a semicolon. When you uh, assign a value, you put a semicolon at the end, etc. Um, how do we split a statement over two or more lines? So if we have a really long statement, what can we do? We can uh, split a statement after an arithmetic or relational operator, such as plus, minus, uh, multiply, divide, uh, assignment, double equals, greater than, or less than. These are examples. Opening curly brace, opening bracket, or parenthesis, and uh, closing curly brace. Do not split after an identifier, a value, or a return keyword. Uh, or a closing curly, uh, or sorry, closing bracket, square bracket, or parenthesis. Rules for creating identifiers. Um, an identifier 
is the name you give a specific uh, variable, method, etc. It's how you identify it. It's the name. Um, it should not be a uh, Java keyword, which we'll uh, talk about. That's this one right here. So that's a very major one is you can't name it, for example, if or Boolean or abstract. These are uh, usually illegal, sometimes just bad ideas, um, but don't do that. Um, identifier, even if they're not illegal, it's a bad idea to have it as the same name as either a globally available uh, property, okay, or um, reserved word. This will actually flag a compiler error. This um, won't, um, but it's still bad, okay, so don't call a variable window or try to do anything funky like that because uh, that's global, globally available um, object. Identifiers can only contain letters, numbers, the underscore, and the dollar sign. Identifiers cannot start with a number. So this is very similar if you're familiar with any other programming language. Pretty much every programming language has you know, something very similar to that, similar uh, syntax rules. Um, not all languages allow you to use dollar sign, but Java, for example, does. JavaScript does also, as we see here. But I typically avoid dollar sign except for... Um, when we start using jQuery and also um, as the shortcut for get element by ID and things like that, but um, I wouldn't overuse it because it usually has different meaning in different languages. Identifiers can't start with a number. Identifiers are case sensitive, like we said earlier. Identifiers can be any length. Identifiers can't be the same as reserved words um, and avoid the use of global properties and methods as identifiers. Here are some valid identifiers in JavaScript. So subtotal, index underscore one, dollar sign by itself, that's a valid identifier. Tax rate, calculate underscore click, dollar sign log, those are all valid. Um, camel case versus underscore notation. Um, you should be consistent with what you use. Um, I would highly recommend uh, for JavaScript at least use camel notation, camel um, case. For HTML, it's very common to use underscore notation, but when you're making variables, this is for like IDs and classes and stuff in um, uh, CSS and HTML, it is used frequently. Um, but camel case, I would recommend highly to use camel case in JavaScript and any programming language you use. It's called camel case because it looks like the humps of a camel because of the capital letters every once in a while. You, start, you basically raise the first letter of any word in the statement you're making as the identifier. So I could say Michigan tax rate, and then in that case, the T and the R in tax rate would be capitalized, and then Michigan would be not, would not be. So the M, uh, in this case, the T is lowercase because it's the first word, calculates lowercase because it's the first word, but any subsequent word is capitalized. Now you might think, well, why not just put a space? Well, you can't put spaces in identifiers names, remember? So that's why we do it this way. Some people prefer putting the underscore, but in general that's, uh, to a lot of developers that might seem like kind of an older uh, style. Um, it is uh, frequently used though still in HTML and CSS. I've seen it quite a bit. Use meaningful names for identifiers. That way your identifiers aren't likely to be reserved words or global properties. Be consistent. Use either camel casing or underscores. I'm going to strongly encourage you to get used to camel casing in JavaScript. If you're using underscore notation, use all lowercase for all letters. Um, this um, is a JavaScript set of JavaScript code that uses comments. Um, there are two different types of comments that you should be familiar with. The comments um, are the things that are in, in between either forward slash star and star for, uh, forward slash that delimits a comment. Or if it's on a single line, you can put it with just two forward slashes. The um, two forward slashes, these are single line comments. Um, the double or the uh, forward slash star with the delimited star forward slash. These are called block comments or multi line comments. Um, so these are just examples. They are completely ignored by the JavaScript engine. They're basically for the purpose of documenting your code better um, to uh, show what it does. Um, it's it's good for you and for your um, coworkers or others that may be looking at your code later on. Uh, don't use comments unnecessarily. Um, so, for example, it's not a good comment probably if you put 
say, a comment over here next to these variable declarations that says um, these are variables or something like that. That doesn't really make that much sense to do that because it's pretty obvious you're declaring variables. Um, the idea behind comments is that you're not typically writing it for an ignoramus. Um, you're writing it for someone else or yourself who should know at least the basics of the code. Um, you're not trying to teach a coding lesson inside of comments typically, unless you're specifically doing that, which sometimes is the case for people like myself, right, because it's their job. Um, but in general, production level code, you're, you're going to only use useful comments and not overuse them. Guidelines for using comments. Use comments to describe portions of code that are hard to understand. That's a very good use for them. Use comments to comment out portions of code that you don't want to test. So at a particular um, point in time, you might decide that, hey, you know, I don't really feel like testing that part. I want to focus in on another part. But you don't want to delete a certain uh, set of um, t uh, code. So in this case, you just comment it out and don't use comments unnecessarily. So more terms you should be familiar with. Um, statement, white space, identifier, camel casing, comment, and what it means to comment out a set of something, such as code. Here are uh, common methods of the window object. Um, the window object is very special. Okay, so first of all, an object. So what's an object? One well, object is a collection of methods and properties. Okay, well that requires further um, definition. Methods perform a function or do actions. Properties are data. So in object-oriented programming, we have the object at the center, and then inside the object you have its behaviors, which are like the methods, and then you have things about the object, usually nouns to describe it and data about the object, those are typically in JavaScript called properties. So objects contain methods, which are behaviors or actions. Properties are the data or things about the object. To access either the methods um, or the properties, you use the dot operator. That's a fancy word for the period. Okay, so we have the object name, dot, method name, and then parameters to the method. Um, here are common methods of the Windows window object. The window object is very special because it's the only um, global object for JavaScript. That means it's accessible from anywhere. JavaScript lets you omit the object name and dot operator when referring to window objects. So for example, I can just write the word alert uh, followed with the, by the string in my code. I don't have to put window.alert, although that is optional. Same thing for prompt and then the print method is another common um, method of the window object. A statement that calls the prompt method with the object name omitted. So here's an example here. So although it is technically window.prompt, we don't have to um, put window in front of the prompt uh, method here. That's because window is globally available and it's the only one that you can omit um, the dot operator and the object name from because it belongs to the window object. It's available to anything in Java script. So prompt and this right here, first parameter or first argument is a string that's required, comma, the second argument here is an optional um, default value. Um, here's one property. We already talked about methods of the uh, window object, alert, prompt, and print. But there's also properties. Remember, methods are the behaviors. Properties are data. So location is one of them. Um, this is the URL of the current web page. So if you ever need to do something to the URL of the current web page or print it out, this is where you are. Um, this is a level above you. This is, you know, uh, some other value. Um, you can access it through location. The syntax for accessing a property of an object is using the dot uh, operator again. A method that displays the URL of the window object would be something like alert which is part of the window object also, and then window.location. So again, terms that you should be familiar with, object, uh, which you should know are a collection of methods and uh, properties. I don't know why they didn't include property here. Uh, what it means to call a method, that's when you actually use it. The window object, global object, 
so object available anywhere. Window is one of them. Um, window is uh, the global object. So also the dot operator. So what is the dot operator? Um, inside of JavaScript, uh, many languages have various data types. Like, for example, Java has eight um, primitive data types that are built in. Um, but in Java, a language like Java, you have the uh, byte, short, int, long, uh, float, double, uh, boolean, char, etc. So because Java is an example of a uh, strongly or strictly typed language, uh, JavaScript is not so. JavaScript is... Um, a loosely or uh, weakly typed language. Um, it is not strictly typed, so you don't declare the data type at the beginning. So there are actually a less need for distinction, at least at the high level of these different these different types. For example, like a, a real number and an integer are all considered just numbers. Um, anything in double or single quotes in, in JavaScript are strings. Um, you've got, for example, JavaScript in double quotes, sing, string data in single quotes. Those are both strings. doesn't really matter which one you choose. And then you've got the empty string here. has no data in it, just two double quotes next to each other. Could you also do it with two single quotes. And Boolean values are special, true and false. So you should be aware that there are three primitive data types in JavaScript, three primitive data types in JavaScript. So you've got number, string, and Boolean. And you should know the difference between those. So you should know the terms related to data types. Okay, um, infinity and negative infinity are special um, because they basically, if you try to store a number that's too large for the integer or for the uh, number data type to hold, it will set the value infinity anytime you try to print it out. If it's too small, like very negative, it'll print out negative infinity. So what's this other stuff? Well, uh, number data type, that's any kind of number. Integer and decimal types are the types of number data types. So an integer is a whole number that's a number that does not have a decimal point. Okay, so you should know that from your math. Um, if not, just know that it's a whole number, integer. Um, um, another definition for integer would be the counting numbers and their opposites. A decimal value is a real number, for example, pi, uh, 3.14159, etc. Uh, anything with a decimal place or that can be written with a decimal value, real numbers called a decimal value. Floating point numbers, that um, is any number also with a decimal point. Um, however, floating point notation. Um, the very large or very small numbers that you might need, um, you might use floating point notation. Um, I thought they showed an example. There it is. Yeah, negative 3.7e to the negative 9. That means it's like basically um, it's a negative 3.7 times 10 to the negative 9th. So it's an extremely small decimal place. Um, String data type, went over that. Empty string, we went over that. Um, so we've got the idea that we have behaviors that we can perform, which are methods. And we've got data that describes ob objects. Um, these are the properties. Now, what about how do we actually do math? How do we work on data in general? Well, these can be done with uh, various numeric expressions. And uh, the first four Arithmetic operators are common to nearly all programming languages. Um, the addition operator, subtraction operator, multiplication operator, and division operator. Um, the next uh, couple are very common to most, uh, to a lot of, not, maybe not most, but to a lot of programming languages. You've got the first four probably makes sense to you if you have any basic algebra. Um, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. Right, gives you the results over here. Well, this one might be a little bit funky. Percent sign, you're like, okay, does it have anything to do with percentages? Well, it doesn't. It's just a special symbol if you see it between two numbers. In other words, it's the operator, and you have an operand on either side. Um, this means modulus. Now, modulus is also called the remainder or the residue operator um, when you're discussing number theory. Um, 
it is pretty simple. It's you divide the number on this side by that number on this side, and the answer is not the quotient like it would be um, with a division operation. Rather, it's the remainder. So how many times does 4 fit into 13, you ask? Well, it fits 3 times, but what is 3 times 4? It's not 13, it's 12. Well, I can't fit another 4 in there, but I have 1 left over because 12 and 13 are 1 apart. That's the result. You have the remainder. Um, likewise, if I had uh, 5 modulus 3, 3 fits in a 5 only once with a remainder of 2. So 5 modulus 3 is 2. Um, the increment and decrement operators should know those names. You should be able to see this and say, oh, that's increment, that's decrement. These, you'll notice, they do not have um, two operands on either side. It's just one operand and then the operator addition operator and subtraction, or well, increment operator and decrement operator. It's such a common task in programming languages to add and subtract one to a specific variable that they have this shortcut syntax for it. So the order of precedence, um, you've got uh, increment and decrement, and then you've got the multiplicative operators, and then the subtractive or the additive operators and multiplicative operators. So multiplicative, you have multiplication, division, and modulus. Those three belong together. So it's like, uh, you know, please excuse my dear uh, or my dear um, modulus, Aunt Sally. Um, so <laughs> my dear m mother, Aunt, my wonderful mother. Never mind. So um, you can come up with an acronym on your own, I'm sure. So you've got the addition and subtraction. That's the lowest precedence. Um, examples of precedence and parentheses. So you can actually use parentheses to override precedence because in this statement right here, the result would be 23 because you'd have 4 times 5. Even though the 3 comes first, the addition comes first, 4 times 5 would be executed first because... Um, it has higher precedence than the uh, addition. So you have 4 times 5, that's 20. 3 plus 20 is 23. But parentheses can overrule this. So you have 3 plus 4, that's 12. Um, I'm sorry, 12. That's 7 times 5, and that's 35. Okay. So terms related to numeric expressions you should be familiar with. Numeric expression, arithmetic metic operator, modulus operator, and order of precedence. The most useful assignment operators um, are the just the direct regular old assignment operator and then you've got the compound addition uh, assignment operator. Sometimes it's just called the compound assignment operator. This is a shortcut term um, or a shortcut um, in order to make it easier to add or um, subtract, you can actually use minus equals as well, and multiplication equals. But you'll notice, here's the example here. If I have subtotal equals uh, 74.95, subtotal plus equals 20 is the exact same as if I wrote out subtotal equals subtotal plus 20. So it's shortcut. It says take the thing on the right, add it to the thing on the left, and then store it into this variable on the left. So basically, you're just adding whatever is on the right. So it's kind of an enhanced version of the increment operator. Three ways to increment a counter variable. So I set the counter equal to 1. Counter equals counter plus 1. That increments it to 2. Counter plus equals 1. That uses the compound assignment operator. And then counter plus plus. That causes it to increment once because it's the increment operator. Okay. You have to be careful with floating point values because they aren't always as precise as you'd think. They're store it's the way the computer stores them in memory. So you have to be very, very careful using things like equals or not equals when comparing floating points because you may not get what you expect. Um, it's better to use relational rather than equality operators such as uh, greater than, less than, um, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, rather than just strictly saying equal to, because if you try to compare some uh, seven four point nine five um, to 
uh, you do this multiplication here by 0.1, you're going to have a very, very bad day comparing it to 7.495 because you've got this little dangly 0.1 over here, or 0.000001. Um, you're going to have a problem. So it's better to be a little bit uh, graceful when you use floating point uh, comparisons. So terms for working with variables. You've got the term variable. That is basically just a, a named location in memory. You've got uh, the concept of declaring a variable. That's when you actually use the var keyword right here to say, I'm going to use this variable or use a, a variable named subtotal for something. And then you have the variable assignment, which is the initialization. That's the first time you give it a value. Um, then um, assi that's assigning a value. Assignment statement uses an assignment statement. Assignment operator is just the equal sign, right? Equals operator, the equality operator. Uh, I'm sorry, the assignment operator. Equality operator is different. Let's not confuse the two. I think they talk about that in a second. Um, however, we have to be very, very careful. When we're using numeric types, um, the plus means addition. Uh, however, if you're using strings, it does not make sense to add quote-unquote strings. So instead, with strings, it will actually append, for example, Harris to the end of Ray space. So then the result will be Ray Harris. Um, if you try to append a different type to it, it will actually promote that to a string. So it converts this 120 to a string, stores it in months, and everything's happy. Um, that's called concatenation. Okay, so... Remember that when used with a string, this is called not the addition operator when it's with a string. It's called the concatenation operator. Escape sequences that can be used in strings. You've got backslash n, which starts a new line in a string. Uh, backslash double quote. Backslash single quote. Since they normally have other meanings, for example, the delimiting a string, um, you have to put a backslash in front of them to indicate, hey, I want to actually print out and use this as a character. So JavaScript Engine actually looks at these. The language declares or determines that these are actually single characters, even though they took um, two keystrokes to make. You had to actually type backslash in. That's considered the new line character. It's a single character. This is the um, double quote character, the single quote character. So here's your example with how to declare string variables. Again, um, JavaScript is weakly typed, so if you're used to writing the word string at the beginning, don't do it. Just write the word uh, keyword var that says, hey, I'm declaring a variable. This declares it and does not explicitly give it a new value. If you want to declare multiple items per line, you can do that as well. Um, then, in this part, we are setting Ray or setting first name. This is a declare and an assignment at once. So you have our first name equals Ray, comma, last name equals Harris. That's a possibility. You can also use string concatenation when you create a variable. So if I already have two variables. Um, created like first name and last name and they have values, I can actually concatenate them. Notice I'm concatenating last name variable which is a string concatenated with this thing in double quotes which is a comma space. We, Since this is not a variable name but it is still a string, we call this a string literal. String literal instead of a string variable like this and that. String literal is in between them. That's a, literally a string we're writing in the concatenation operation. How do we code compound assignment statements? Well, you can do you can use the compound assignment statement um, with strings as well, and it does pretty much what you expect. It appends to the current string whatever you want on the right side, um, just like it does with addition with numeric types. Here's an example of how escape sequences can be used in a string. So var message equals a valid variable name, and then new line cannot start with a number. Bar message is this isn't. Notice, since we need an apostrophe here, um, it is better to put a backslash um, single quote because that's normally a uh, indicates that it's a beginning or end of a string. 
So we use the escape sequence in order to do it the correct way. Um, well, this you don't, actually, this you don't have to do. Um, because um, since this is using a single quote, you don't really need to, I don't think you need to worry about that. So you should be okay with just putting an apostrophe. Okay. How to declare Boolean variables and assign the values. So we've talked about numeric types, strings, and now let's talk about Boolean. So var is valid equals false. The only two values that you can set for a Boolean va uh, variable are true and false. They can't take any other values. With numeric types and string types, we're used to this smorgasbord of all these different uh, possibilities, but Boolean are quite um, boring in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, as far as variety is concerned, but they're actually quite powerful. Um, computers innately deal with true-false values. Um, so since we're used to uh, zeros and ones with computers, we use a lot Boolean to deal with um, um, conditions, which we'll talk about next, I believe. Um, so terms for string expressions you need to be familiar with are concatenate, String literal, escape sequence. Um, how does JavaScript interpret the plus sign if, uh, with mixed expressions? If both values are numbers, JavaScript adds them. If both values are strings, JavaScript concatenates them. That's pretty straightforward. If one value is a number and one's a string, JavaScript automatically converts the number to a string. So in that case, you have two strings being quote unquote added. So what does that mean? They're actually being concatenated. Okay, um, here are two methods that you should be extremely familiar with: parse int and parse float. Um, the uh, description, heavy description, is on pages 70 or on pages 70 and 71 in the Muroc book. Um, two methods of the window object for converting string values are parse int and parse float. Uh, parse int returns an integer uh, value of the string if possible. If not, it returns not a number, uh, which is nan. It's a special value, nan. Parse float string. Parse float returns the floating point equivalent of whatever the string is if it's possible. You can also use something called chaining. Um, notice that we get an entry here prompt for a value. This is the default. Let's say they don't you know, do anything else. They just leave the default value. Uh, alert will display um, that value right here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, dot 6, 7, 8, 9. You can also chain method calls. So I have the method called parse int um, with the string passed to it. And then whatever that returns is being passed as a, uh, an argument to alert. So alert just prints 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You might look at that and say, well, hey, wait a minute, what happened to the point 6, 7, 8, 9? Um, shouldn't it round up because it's using parse int? And the answer is no, actually. Since you're doing parse int and not parse float, um, parse float would keep the decimal part. But parse int, um, yeah, as we see right here, actually, parse float keeps it. But parse int does not round up, it just completely gets rid of whatever's behind the decimal point, regardless of whether you would normally do banker's rounding or standard rounding or what have you, it does not matter, okay? It will actually just delete and completely remove whatever the decimal part is. This is called truncation, okay? So we say that um, the decimal portion was truncated when parse int was called on this uh, string. So it's truncated. So don't get concatenate and truncate confused. You should commit those terms to memory because you will hear them hundreds and millions of times in your career if you deal with any kind of programming whatsoever, uh, web or otherwise. So truncate means that it's removing some sort of data. So in this case, it truncates the decimal part um, of the value when it calls, we call percent. Uh, concatenate is when you take two strings and you uh, append the second string to the first string. That's concatenate. So you should be familiar with not a number. That's a special value that's returned if it can't um, 
um, convert. So for example, if we have entry C here, which is a variable, call prompt and just keep the default, which is a string. Um, if you say alert entry C, it will display hello, because alert doesn't care um, if it's an integer or a float or um, a boolean or anything right here, it just displays whatever it is. However, when you call parse int on entry C, parse int expects a string that can be converted to an integer. Well, I don't know about you, but last time I tried to convert hello to an integer, I ended up blowing up my backyard. So that's not good. You can't do that. So if you try to convert a string that does not have, is not consisting of numbers that can be converted to an integer, and you call parse int on it, it will display or return NAN, capital N, lowercase a, capital N, special value, which means not a number. It can't do it. can't deal with it. Um, so these are the relational operators. These are, we're building on this because we want to be able to con, uh, code some special constructs um, in our code called control structures. So normally we're used to things going one step at a time in our code. But control statements or control structures um, let us control how information is processed in an application. These statements include the if statements as well as the looping statements, which we'll look at in just a second. Um, so this, uh, if you ever hear the topic um, flow of control or um, the uh, control flow or something like that, then that's what they're talking about typically is our ability to branch off in one direction or another based on the state of certain variables or uh, values or the return values of function or methods, um, all kinds of different things. So the user doesn't enter their name right, you pop up a warning. If they enter it right, you try to log them in. There's all kinds of different possibilities. Um, so these are the relational operators. The first two are sometimes broken off into a category by themselves and called the equality operators, but they do relate to values. Um, this does not assign a value. So this right here, when I say last name equals equals Harris, this is the equality operator. It does not set last name variable to Harris. It does not set test score to 10. What it's doing is it takes this value and that value, compares them, and if they are equal, um, the relational operator returns true. So all of these relational operator re raters return a Boolean value. So that means they can only return one of two possibilities. They can return a true or they can return a false. Um, less than, for example, less than doesn't really make as much sense with um, uh, strings for our purposes um, right now, although you can do that um, lexicographically. But right now, age minus 18, or less than 18, if the age entered or obtained somehow is less than 18, it will return true. If the um, age is equal to 18, this will return false because we say it's, it has to be strictly less than, or if age is greater than 18, it will return false. Um, so we also have less than or equal to. We don't have a single symbol on the keyboard like we do uh, when we write out mathematics and have less than and then the equal kind of a line under the less than. Um, so since there is not a symbol for that on the keyboard, all you have to do is type two keystrokes to indicate less than or equal or greater than or equal. So in that case you do less than sign than the equal sign. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, as, uh, to pop back up here just for a second, this is not equal to. This means um, exclamation point equal symbol. That means not equal. It returns, always returns the opposite of what equal would. So for example, if the first name is uh, Ray, then if I said first name equal equal Ray, that would return true. If it is um, if it is Ray, and then I say first name not equal to Ray, that returns false. So, because this only returns true if the first name is not equal to Ray. The syntax of the globally available is NAN method is as follows. You have is NAN, um, and then you put an expression. Examples of the is NAN method, we've got uh, is not a number, Harris, this returns true. It takes a string and it tells you whether it can be converted to a number or not. So Harris 
cannot be converted to a number directly, but 123.45 can. So is not a number returns false, because this is a number, right? Um, so we learned about relational operators, but there's other operators that deal with Boolean values also. If I have to um, uh, make it so that two or more um, have to be combined in some way, then I have to use the logical operators. There are three of them. There's the not operator, which is unary. It only takes one operand. So in this case, um, it's a method call, but it could be not and then some Boolean, because is nan is Boolean, so that's perfectly okay. Um, and over here, logical and uh, combines these two values. So what does and mean versus or? So you do the two ampersands for and and two uh, the flat bars, vertical pipes. It's above the enter key on most keyboards on the same key as the uh, backslash. Um, you hold down shift backslash then you get the or pipes. So you might ask, well, what's the difference between and and or? Well, and says that both of these need to be true, and then the whole statement is true. For example, if the person is greater than 17 and their score is less than 70, then this whole statement will return true. But let's say the person's score is um, 60, okay, so that part's true, but their age is uh, 15. That means this is false, that is true, false and true is false, because both of them need to be uh, true in order for the whole thing to be true. So in that case, the whole thing would be false. Um, right down here, or is kind of just the opposite. With or, um, both of them can be true, or just one of them can be true. The only time when, fall, when or is false is when both of these are false. So as long as we get one of these to be true, then this whole statement will be true. For example, let's say um, is not a number returns um, false, because we'll say it is a number, and then we have end up with rate that is uh, greater than zero, then that's false. So false and false, false or false is false. But if rate is um, you know less than zero, then that's true. So be familiar with conditional expression, and also be able to describe relational operators and logical operators. How are they similar? How are they different? Pay attention to what kind of um, operands they take. In other words, the thing on either side of the symbol. Um, so what are they used for? So now here is where the magic is. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest you take a break. I would probably give a break about now. So I'm going to pause the video, and I want you to take a break, kind of stretch, um, you know, use the bathroom, get water, whatever you want to do, and then come back in just a few minutes and um, check this out again. So I'll talk to you in a second. Okay, so now that you've had a chance to take a little bit of a break, um, let's take a look at the if statement. So this is our first real um, move into the control st uh, statements that JavaScript provides us with. Um, if statement is a type of selection control statement. It allows us to select among uh, different um, types of, or different sets of uh, code, different blocks of code based on a particular condition. Now one thing I want you to be extremely aware of right now, and as far as this uh, slide is concerned, is that these brackets are not actually part of the syntax. They're trying to indicate that these are optional. You can have an if statement just by itself with some statements associated with it without having else if. And also optionally you can have an else block as well. So just be aware of that. The curly braces on the other hand and the parentheses are actually part of the syntax. So it's a little bit funky that they did that, um, but a lot of times when you see something in brackets in a programming language book, they're indicating that it's optional. Um, so just be aware of that. It is not when you deal with arrays and things like that, which we'll get to later on in the course. Um, an if statement with an else clause. So here's a uh, concrete example here. So let's say we have a variable age that has had some sort of value uh, put in, maybe by a prompt or um, 
pulled from a control of some sort. So you're going to say, if the age is greater than or equal to 18, it, you get an alert that says you may vote. Otherwise, you get an alert that says you're not old enough to vote. So when it gets to this point, it no longer goes in sequence and does every statement it interacts with or it uh, comes in, uh, in contact with. It instead will actually make a decision. Okay, so if the age is greater than or equal to 18, it will alert you may vote, and then it'll skip over this whole block associated with the else. So as soon as it finds a match, it's done. But if this is false, else means that's the default value. It's the only other possibility. So it'll, it'll uh, alert you are not old enough to vote. So here's an if statement with else if and else clauses. So you've got the if clause up here. If the rate that's input is not a number, it says you did not provide a number for the rate. Else if, so if this is false, it will check the next one. So else if rate's less than zero, the rate may, rate may uh, not be less than zero. So let's say we've gotten past this point because it is a number. Let's say the right rate is not less than zero. If the rate's greater than 12, it says the rate may not be greater than 12. Let's say it skips over all of these because none of these are true. That means that the rate is a valid rate. So we'll just print out the rate is and then put rate here. Here's an if statement with a compound conditional expression. If you were wondering why we were using um, the uh, logical operators and such um, earlier, this is why. So you've got the or, logical or, and you've got is not a number. If it's not a number or the user entry is less than or equal to zero, then it will say, please enter a valid number greater than zero. So how to test a Boolean variable. If you want to test it to see if it's true, you could, let's say we have a Boolean variable name is valid, you could just say is valid equal equal true. Um, so that seems to make sense, more sense in English, but uh, or in programming, but it, it's not actually any better than this one, if is valid. So. Um, that's the same as is valid equals true, because if you really think what's going on, if is valid is a Boolean, and if statements um, require that a Boolean ver a value occurs in the if clause, the uh, print between the parentheses, then this is already okay, because it's already a Boolean. So by saying uh, if it's true, that's kind of redundant, because if the variable is true, then this is enough. But if it's true here, it would say true is equal to true, well, that's true. The whole thing's true, so um, it would still do it. So um, I would get in a habit of doing this syntax, where you just use the variable or the uh, not in front of it. Typically, it's just considered redundant um, and not necessarily any better, uh, providing better readability by putting the equals equals true. So I would just leave it there. And if it's not valid, in other words, if... Um, it's f uh, the is valid is false, the not is valid returns a true, which means that it will be executed. So um, use this syntax right there. That's better, typically. Um, so that if statement is a type of selection control structure. It decides whether or not to do something or to do something among several options. We have a different type of control structure. So normally we do stuff in sequence, so that's called sequential control. If you use an if statement, for example, that's called selection control because you're selecting among alternatives. The next couple things we're going to look at are repetition control structures, or also known as iterative control structures. So while loop is one of these examples. If you're familiar with Java, then this should look very, very similar to you. Java, C++, C Sharp, they all have something like a while loop here. So here's the general syntax. You have while, then in parentheses you have the loop continuation condition that goes here. Um, it has to stay true as long as the loop is to keep going. Uh, and then you have the statements that you want to uh, occur. Notice there's no semicolon after the closing curly brace, same with if statements, or uh, method bodies, or anything like that. So we have var sum of numbers is zero, um, so here's a loop that adds the numbers one through five, you have the sum of numbers initialized to zero, number of loops is five, counter is one. So you're saying while the counter, which is currently one, is less than or equal to number of loops, which is five, so that whole thing is true at the beginning, 
then you say sum of numbers plus equals counter. So what does that do? That adds the counter into sum of numbers. Then here's the important part. You have to increment the counter in this case to move it towards uh, the number of loops because if you do not this loop will just keep going on uh, theoretically forever. That's why it's called an infinite loop. If you don't move towards this loop continuation statement being false because if I just keep counter at 1 and number of loops at 5 then that's going to cause um, 1 less than or equal to 5 is true and it's going to keep being true forever so that's why we have to keep incrementing counter so the second time through the loop counter will be 2 then 3 4 5 now when it gets to 6 6 is not less than or equal to 5 so it will break out of the loop and then go to the next line and just print out the sum of the numbers so it's pretty cool um, do while loop is very important also it's very similar to the while loop except this one is the only uh, post test loop and it also does have this one does have a semicolon at the end of the while statement so be very careful to distinguish between these two we do the same thing with the loops um, do then the body then the test of the loop continuation statement you might think well what's the difference well, they print out the exact same thing if the state, as long as the statement remains true. The difference is that since it is post-test, meaning it tests after it does whatever it has in the body of the loop, um, do while is guaranteed to execute to do its thing at least once. Even if, let's say counter is set to um, 20 right here that would obviously make this false 20 is not less than or equal to 5 however this will um, sum the counter into the sum of numbers so you'll get at least one in here and then increment counter to 2 so um, or did we say I think we said uh, counter would if counter equaled 20 and number loops equals 5 so yeah 20 so it'd be 21 by this point and then it would see, oh, well, that's false, and then it would print out 21. So you have to be very, very careful and aware of that. Do while is guaranteed to execute at least once. Okay, here's a while loop that gets the average of numbers. To get an average, you have to, um, you know, keep, uh, this one is really interesting because they say, uh, please enter a number, and then if they um, click cancel, it returns false. So that would be not a number at this point and then it would cause this loop to break out so that's kinda cool so what all it's doing is it's totaling up as long as there's a number to um, add it's incrementing count well you might think well since we're not using count in order to determine the loop continuation why do we have to use a count well we have to calculate the average so after the loop is done you say var average equals total which is the total we got from adding up um, the user's input into total using the compound assignment operator right here we get the total and then you divide by the count which is counting the number of numbers and you know from your basic math classes that you've probably taken that if I want to find the mean or the average um, the that type of average the mean of numbers I have to add the numbers together and then divide by the number of numbers Okay, which is the count. That's exactly what you're teaching the computer to do. So it's not really that surprising. Um, syntax for a for statement. So we've gone over while and do while. While is pretest because it tests first. Do while is post test, but they have similar syntax. For loop is also pretest like while, um, but the uh, initialization, the loop continuation condition, and the increment or decrement toward termination of the loop are all in the header so it keep, makes it a lot less likely that you're going to um, create an infinite loop for loops are used very very um, often for anything that's a count controlled loop because as you'll notice this is based on a counter value so it counts up until it gets to a number of loops and does its thing um, similar to what we had earlier so count controlled loops for loops are perfect for that you can do it with while loops but one thing that while loops are good for are sentinel or flag controlled um, loops. You'll notice this one, this loop is not based on counting. It's not based on counting, it's based on a specific event or a specific thing taking place. In this case, 
we call the, the method is not a number on the number that's entered each time and it's not determined ahead of time how many times this loop's going to go. They could, they could enter you know, 24 values or they can enter 1 or cancel at the very beginning. Um, so as long as there's a number to be added in here it'll keep adding. So the counter is just to do the math. It has nothing to do with the control of the loop. So we would call this a sentinel controlled loop. So while and do while are better for that. For loops, better for count control because you don't have to worry about putting the counter increment in the body um, or initializing it outside of the loop and doing the test inside here. All of it's in the header. Okay. But it functionally does the same thing. Um, okay, so be familiar with all of these terms. You should be familiar with the if and else if and else, okay, and know how to use them. Nested if statements, that's when you have one if statement inside of another, so be familiar with that. There's some examples, I believe, in the, uh, uh, in the book. And also be familiar with the um, repetition control structures we learned about, while, do while, and for, and also how to do it, how to use counters and uh, index, which is like the number that keeps changing. Okay, so um, let me see here. Let's do an example. So I've been doing a lot of talking, so it might be good to do maybe a brief example. Um, oh, give me just a second. Sorry about that. I was noticing that my um. I hope that didn't uh, affect the video. Um, I noticed that there was a um, virus scan running, sadly, um, so hopefully it didn't cause there to be too much uh, lag on the video. So, all right, so I in Optana Studio, I created a new project here. Again, you go to File, New, Web Project, and just follow the prompts and give it a good name. So I called this one Chapter 2 instead of Chapter 2 Test, but same thing, essentially. Um, this one I'm just going to create an HTML file, so I go to uh, right-click and then I go to New File. Um, in this case, I'm going to just call it, um, we'll call it index, I guess, index.htm. Uh, you know what, index.html, let's rename it. Uh, where is it? Rename, there we go. Okay, so. Here we go, okay. So inside here, doc type. Um, HTML, nope, not that, HTML, there we go, so HTML, got the two there, head, I'm going to put a title, we'll, we'll say the calculate, um, oops, MPG application, okay, so we got our title right there, so for all HTML, um, I'm going to add a body, Okay, inside the body, I'm going to use a semantic tag section, put an H1, and all I'm going to put here is this page is displayed after the JavaScript is executed. Okay, so far so good. Now, we're going to put the script for this JavaScript, this particular JavaScript, inside the header or the heading. So inside of the head, um, we're going to put alert the calculate MPG application. Okay, that's an alert. Then we're going to set var miles equal to prompt. I'm going to say enter miles driven. Then we're going to say miles equals parse float of miles because we want to remember the th when it comes in to a prompt um, or controls and things like that, the value that's returned is actually a string. So here's our problem. We have a string here and we can't do math on it because if we try to do addition and things like that, um, we're going to get concatenation. We're not going to get what we want. So we have to actually, we're reusing the variable here. Here's one of the magic of JavaScript that you couldn't achieve in other languages, many other languages, because of the weak, weak typeness. We can actually use this miles, which was originally a string, and we're going to convert it here. So when I say parse float of miles, it's going to convert that string to a float and then store that float value into miles. So now at this point, 
miles is a real number, a decimal value, rather um, than a string. So, so far so good. Um, we've got our miles value. Then we're going to say var gallons equals prompt enter gallons of gas used. Okay. And then uh, gallons, we're going to reuse this also. Parse float um, gallons. Good. And then finally var mpg. The miles per gallon is going to be miles divided by gallons. Um, and then mpg equals, uh, we're kind of truncating it, so if there's any um, float value to it, we're just going to um, take it off by using parse int. Remember, because parse int will truncate um, any string or another value that you pass in. We're passing in a float in this case, because this time it's not getting a string. We've got miles, which is a float gallons, which is a float, you'll get a float value for MPG. Now we're converting it to an integer here. So once we get the MPG, we're going to put alert, let's say miles per gallon equals, and then run, put MPG. Okay, so far so good. Let's run it. Let's see if it works. Live television. Okay, calculate the uh, MPG application. You hit OK. It says enter the number of miles driven. Um, let's say that we have 273. Hit OK. It'll say enter gallons used, 12.5. Hit OK. And it'll say miles per gallon is 21. All right. So depending on your system, it might say 21 or 22. It depends on the uh, how the truncation and everything works. So you'll get the um, miles per gallon. And then I'll say, once you hit that, it'll finally go to the body of the application and put this page is displayed after the JavaScript's executed. So far, so good. All right. Um, the next application they show you, I'm going to skip that one and let you work on it. Um, this is the test scores application. Um, we will come back and work on something else in just a second. Um, this is just showing you the Firefox error console. So um, if you wanted to, uh, let me see here. If we worked there, okay. All uh, right, uh, we're gonna open with Firefox. Okay, got that. Um, three, and then let's try to put zero. Not a number is what you end up getting. Um, to use the Firefox error console, you can go to Tools Web Developer um, Error Console. So Tools, oh, I used a different version. Uh, developer, there we go. Um, error Console, I think they moved it. Maybe they moved it. Style Editor, Developer Toolbar. That does look promising, doesn't it? Um, okay. Okay. I guess they're put. They're doing some updates. So, um, yeah, may not be here. I'll look. At, I'll look and find it for next time. I don't usually. I usually use just Uptana uh, when I do it. Um, there's also a. Wait a minute. This is bizarre that it's working funkily. funkily. Okay. Um, okay. Well, it is working. Okay. Um, let's see here. See, live television. It's a bad move. Should have checked this out ahead of time. Silly rabbit. Okay. Um, should be an error console should be on here. I don't see a performance style debugger. Yeah, debugger. If there was an error, it should uh, pop up. There you go. There's there's some of the error. Um, it will. So it's a, it's slightly different with the this version of uh, uh, Firefox. So you got style editor, performance, network, all kinds of 
cool stuff down here. So the inspector lets you inspect specific elements. So if I hover over it, it'll take me to the different elements. It's kind of cool. And then the, this is the error console. You can actually click on JS to show you the JavaScript error. So that's good. Um, so if we take, um, just to <clears throat> check it out, let's uh, remove a, s uh, do something here, bad. Okay, I'm going to remove the uh, parentheses there. I'm going to go back here, I'm going to refresh this. And you'll notice now here, it'll say syntax error missing, um, parenthesis after argument list. And it even tells you what line, it'll say, um, line 18 character 3 so if you click on that it points to it so even though this is not the line with the actual error this is where it's detected so if you look immediately above it that's usually where the error was so there you go so again it's there uh, developer um, and then you're able to use the uh, developer toolbar um, and then the uh, debugger which is useful the web console. So all of that's very, very uh, useful. Once you click that though, you've got access to all these things down here. So the debugger, um, this is allowing you to look at different uh, aspects uh, of the overall thing, but the console is going to really show you information. So CSS, JavaScript, so it shows you the JavaScript error. Character encoding of the HTML was not declared. So, um, if we go back and we fix it, put that in the semicolon there, and then I'm going to refresh it again, it should uh, work again. So, 100, 2, good, 50 miles a gallon, don't you wish. Okay, so now it's complaining about a character encoding issue, but it's not, uh, it's not a uh, JavaScript issue. So, that's pretty good. Um, the next thing I want to do is um, on page 88, there's an exercise 2 one. It says to add validation to the MPG application. So I'm going to go back here and uh, with the uh, application running here, I'm going to add some validation. So we run the application and we note that the um, if we uh, run it with invalid entries, um, so for example, if I go back here and refresh, if I have that, if the miles driven we put zero and gallons of gas used zero, it'll say not a number. And you might think, well, what the crap is up with that? Well, you can't divide by zero unless you're Chuck Norris. So that's the that's the reason you're getting an error. So we're going to add an if statement that validates the miles entry after that statement, or after the statement that parses it. Um, this uh, if statement should check if the entry is not a number or if the entry is less than uh, or equal to zero. So if either of the conditions are true, display an appropriate error message when we're done. The if statement should be something like this. So um, we want to look at the miles. Miles is the major concern because you can't you're going to be dividing by miles and it can't be zero. So we're going to say if is nan, not a num, miles, um, or miles less than or equal to zero. Oops. Eptana yeah, trying to be helpful here. Um, notice also I put the curly brace on the next line. Um, that is totally valid. So just be aware of that. Uh, in the book, they frequently use uh, what's called KNR style um, or same line style, which is this, sometimes with a space. Um, I prefer to go on the next line, which is called next line style, not surprisingly, or Almond style, named after Eric Almond, not the nut, Almond. Uh, it's Eric Almond. Um, and then I'm just going to put alert. Miles must be a number greater than zero. Okay. We're also going to valid, uh, validate the gallons entry after that statement. Uh, should check if the entry is not a number or if the entry is less than zero. Um, if either of these conditions is true, we display an appropriate message. So same thing for gallons. Um, if uh, is not a number, pass gallons to it or gallons less than or equal to zero. 
My goodness. Okay. All right. So alert. Gallons must be a number uh, greater than or equal to zero. Okay. We should probably change greater than or equal to. Oh, you know what? No. Um, we want. Yeah, greater than zero. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Never mind. Greater than zero. Explicitly greater than because we're testing if it is less than or equal to zero. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, um, then we're going to add a do while loop for each entry. It contains the statements that get parse and validate the entry. Loop should continue until the entry is valid. Um, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'll, I'll leave that up to you as an exercise, but we're going to see if this works. Um, calculate MPG. If I put zero there, it's going to say miles must be a number greater than zero, but it continues on. And then asks me for the gas, tells me an error again, and then says not a number. So if you wanted to, um, what I would recommend, instead of putting an if statement here, uh, or instead of putting if statements here, um, see what happens, or see if you can get it so that it prompts the user inside of a while loop, and make sure that these these are uh, the case. Okay, so uh, check out the example they give you on page 88. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Hopefully, um, this is uh, helpful to you, and hopefully you've enjoyed this lecture. Um, please try out exercise... Uh, 2-1 in its entirety, and also uh, try 2-2 as well. All right, thank you, and have a great day. Goodbye.